Oh, hi, everybody. Ooh, a little spicy there. All right, welcome to uh, Zephyr Onboarding in 30 Seconds, uh, Methods and Experiments During Zephyr Training. I will prompt you all right now. It's not actually 30 seconds. It's a little bit longer. It was like a, there's like a minute-long video where I show it working. Uh, but today's talk is actually about training. Uh, so some of the things we're going to talk about, what are some of the things involved in training? You might be interested in this for your own needs and maybe internally you're trying to push Zephyr at your company. You're trying to get it a little bit broader. Maybe you're looking to start a training business. Maybe you're just looking to help others and bring others into the fold on Zephyr. All of good things. Uh, today we're going to go over some of the challenges, some of the things that went right, some of the things that definitely went wrong, and we'll talk about that. Uh, what actually it takes to have a good training experience overall, a case study, what's been going well for us, and then some alternatives and some things to look at in the future, and I'd love to chat about those afterwards. A little bit about me, I, um, I didn't know how to use Zephyr at first, um, so training is something I wish I would have had a little bit more of when I got started in Zephyr, and uh, I've learned a lot from my coworkers. I work at Goliath as uh, in developer relations lead, and uh, I've been doing hardware for a long time, I've been trying to get better at firmware, and uh, with Zephyr, I think I have been. Uh, I also put a, uh, uh, I'm a reluctant DevOps trainee, you'll see that a little bit later, um, because we're going to talk about some tools that actually you might want to deploy to make this all a little bit easier. A little bit about Goliath, uh, we're an IoT cloud company. <clears throat> this is why I'm doing training kind of on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Uh, I use Zephyr all the time for reference designs, and you can see some of those later if you're interested. Uh, so really good for trying out not only the training, but also being able to use Zephyr all the time. A little bit about why training is hard and we should do it anyways. Uh, one thing is just that it's expensive, right? So if you wanted to do a training, you know, the, the best training would be one-on-one. -on -one. But that would be really, really expensive to you know, look over someone's shoulder and you know, spend four hours with them getting up and started with Zephyr. So you're trying to basically optimize and trying to get one person that can train 10 people, that sort of thing. Another thing is that uh, Zephyr has a learning curve. We should just ad admit that Zephyr has a learning curve. You have to get people up that curve, and you're trying to do it as efficiently as possible. And that's, what, that's another reason we're doing training, of course. Uh, another reason that I'm, I'm doing training is because we're trying to get people connecting hardware to the internet, right? So Zephyr is fantastic for having a wide, wide range of, of uh, connected hardware. Uh, and so we want to do Zephyr so that we can get as many different hardware platforms connected as we can. And I think another thing to admit is that, you know, as much as it's growing, this is a, a very good size audience here, there's still a ton of people in the world that are not yet trying out Zephyr. And they're, they're, there's a lot of hardware and firmware engineers that are, are, are future Zephyr users. And so that's another thing we should look at. All right, let's, let's start with the fun stuff. What went poorly? Um, so uh, we've done two trainings that went kind of poorly. Um, the first one was a, a corporate training we did on site. And we had eight trainees. And again, this is... Uh, we, it was a re relatively small group. We had three people that were training. Uh, and we, <laughs> we thought everybody was using Windows, or everybody was using Linux. And it turns out, no, actually, a lot of the people out in the world use Windows, right? Especially embedded developers coming from the hardware and embedded space. There's a lot of Windows users. Uh, we didn't, uh, you know, there's chocolatey instructions that were around at that point. But uh, we, uh, we didn't have a good handle on those. We were kind of developing those as they came up. And so kind of just acknowledging, yes, people are coming in with lots of different OSs and, and that sort of thing. But other things that are just more logistical, right? You're in a corporate environment. There's firewalls in place. You're trying to download different packages. At the end of the day, a lot of users, a lot of the, the trainees ended up being like, oh, we know how to fix this. And they pulled out their phones and they tethered to their phone. And then they were, over, they were downloading Zephyr packages over cellular. And it's like, OK, well, that's a way around it, but not a great thing for training. So permissions issues, you know, like having admin on a Windows computer, all of these things are things you have to kind of think about. The other, uh, I'm going to say failure, uh, was actually last year uh, at ZDS. Uh, we did training. Uh, we did, a, I think it was about 25 people at ZDS last year in San Francisco. And people came in with, you know, as, as you do, you come in with all different types of hardware, right? You know, different types of computers, right? Linux, Mac, Windows, all these different things. Uh, we learned a little bit from the previous training, and so we brought a Wi-Fi router, we plugged a, a USB mass storage into it. We're like, oh, well, we can, like, serve the files off of that. We have f uh, the files all ready to go. We have the tool chain, everything ready to go. But even that kind of got congested. So another thing is just that you have a lot of people in a room. You're going to have network congestion, and you have to kind of deal with that. Uh, other things that were problematic, 
it was Zephyr training, or sorry, it was a Zephyr summit, so people were looking to get better, but they probably had already tried Zephyr, so they, were, they had some form of Zephyr on their computer, and uh, maybe their path permissions were kind of messed up, or they had different versions of Python, and just dealing with everybody's different thing is uh, another thing you have to think about. You have to think about how people are coming into a training with a computer. Things we haven't tried. So we, um, so Mike and, and I, my, Mike's Dish, my coworker uh, at, in developer relations, we we've know a lot of people who have done training before, and we've seen other things that have worked. Uh, one of which is image laptops, right? So this is people who show up. Uh, one of our friends, Joe Fitz, he shows up at every training in person with 24 laptops, usually Chromebooks, that are imaged the night before. So he does rsync on 24 laptops. That's all he's doing the night before, and he's rolling in with Pelican cases full of laptops. And that's one thing that's great about it, because you have USB access, you know exactly what's on there, the user does whatever they want to that laptop, and then at the end of the time, you're just wiping them out. Uh, down, downside is that you can't do remote training like that, right? You, ha you can't roll it into everybody's house or ship them to, to different corners of the globe. And we are very interested in doing remote training as well, as you might be. Another option is USB sticks. As the graphic shows, um, I don't plug just random ass USB sticks into my computer, I don't know about you, but uh, from a security perspective, please don't. If you talk to your security friends, they will say, please fill your USB ports with cement. That is the safest thing you can do for your computer. Um, and uh, it doesn't, again, it doesn't work for remote training, but it's, uh, you know, you could do a virtual machine. I've talked to some trainers who've done this sort of thing. They might run uh, uh, VMware on a USB stick and try and do that sort of thing. That gets you to kind of a unified environment. That's not bad, uh, but it's not optimal. And again, you can't do it remotely. And then finally, the thing that I always hear, well, why don't you ask your users to pre-install the software? And to that I say, uh, do you live in the real world? Because I have never gone to a training where you have 20 people show up and they're all like, oh yeah, I spent all night installing this tool chain and everything went smoothly. They, they, they usually say, oh, what room are we in again? And we're training Zephyr today? Okay, then they, then they kind of get into it. So I think you really just, you have to plan on, if people aren't gonna do this training, then you're going to have basically two groups, the ones who kind of did the homework and they already are set to go, and the ones who are spending a good chunk of time installing tools. Like I said last year at ZDS, it didn't go like we wanted it to, and about 30 to 40 minutes in, we only had a portion of the users that were like ready and into exercises. So you want to kind of figure that stuff out. So let's talk about some truisms about training in general, right? So we want to start by assuming nothing, right? You basically say, I don't know what a user is going to show up with, you don't know, you know, you're going to learn about Linux distributions you've never heard of before. We actually had one user at a training I'll talk about later. He showed up uh, with a laptop that had broken the night before, and he's like, hey, I have a Steam Deck with me, and my laptop's broken. Can I do this on a Steam Deck? And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. So if you don't know, that's a handheld gaming console, right? So like a screen, like a nine-inch screen or something. So people are going to show up with all kinds of hardware, assume nothing about it other than they probably can access a web page, maybe, you know, it's just, you're gonna have to start from that. Uh, the perfect number of things to install on a computer is zero, right? So that is, uh, again, it's a truism, but it's not always realistic. So you kind of like, what is the closest you can approximate this sort of thing? Um, you know, uh, we could, again, if I could ask people to show up with a clean install of an OS, I would, but that is not realistic. So what is, what is the most we can do to this, to approximate this? And finally, it's that downloads take time. So this is kind of that, like, we had a US, best case scenario, we had a USB stick with us, plugged into a router, it's a set up as a mass storage device on a network device. We should be able to download it, but we have to assume that it still takes time. So you don't, you can't assume anything about the network either, right? So this is really painting a negative picture overall of computing uh, in, a, in an age of gigabit downloads and, uh, and, and very, very fast computers. I'm assuming, you know, an EEPC and a, you know, a, a LAN, uh, DSLR, D, DS, DSL connection, rather. Uh, but uh, you kind of have to just kind of assume worst case scenario. All right, uh, so let's talk about a little bit about what we're doing currently, because this is probably what you actually care about. Uh, we use something called Chasm. And so Chasm is uh, it's a desktop as a service uh, solution. Basically, it's, the easy way to think about it is a full Ubuntu machine that lives inside a browser. And I know that this, this seems like overkill, and I'm going to try and uh, argue my point here. Uh, but the thing that I really like about it is that I pre-install the Zephyr toolchain, uh, a project, and uh, kind of a bunch of helper tools in there, VS Code, plugins, all the things that you might want to have on a machine, and you have this standardized environment. And I know it's not necessarily uh, the thing you might want to do, but I, I think it is the best, the best case scenarios here. So 
it basically, you log into a browser, you have a login there, and then you get connected to an EC2 machine that is off somewhere in Amazon's massive infrastructure, and you have access to a, you know, a bunch of RAM and a couple processors. But really, you can go from you know, zero to compiled in about 30 seconds to a minute. Um, another thing you have to do, though, is you still need, uh, you still need to have localized debugging and, pro and, and programming tools. And so uh, we switched over to Nordic uh, development kits recently. They're very well supported in, uh, in the Zephyr tree. And um, they also have JLink on board. You could approximate this with a lot of other tools as well. I think having a programmer on board is important, especially if you want to be doing uh, sorry, a debugger on board is important if you want to step debug and, and do that sort of thing in the future. We also like that there is, um, you know, kind of this infrastructure of tools that are tested on multiple OSs, right? So this is, again, Nordic's solution here. They already tested for Linux, Mac, and Windows, and that uh, standardizes the programmer and the serial interface. Uh, we do not uh, actually have a direct connection. So again, we're Somewhere in the cloud, we have a compiler that's happening and running and creating a binary. Currently, we don't have any way to connect to that from a debugger. And that is still something we're interested in. We'd love to talk about that after the fact. Um, but uh, that is not currently possible, so we actually download the binaries, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, another thing I think is important uh, that we do is uh, we actually don't deliver the training. We don't, I don't stand up here and talk to you about, like, now we're going to do this, now we're going to do this. We actually write everything out, and we have it as a standard walkthrough guide. So if you have access to this Chasm machine, you could do that just about at any time. But I think it's really important because you don't want to assume that your users, you know, uh, how, how fast they are, you don't want to lose people, right? One of the, the toughest experiences is just the, the difference in speed when you're, when you're training people. Some people are going to race through stuff, and, excuse me, uh, they're going to race through stuff and be done in, you know, 30 minutes. Some people are going to take the full three or four hours that you allot to them. And you want to make sure that they can kind of go back and review and, and that sort of thing. Uh, written instructions also just generally help you decouple from all this stuff. And, and it gives you kind of a reference point later. Uh, this is training.goliath.io if you ever want to check that out. That's available to, to the public. Another thing that we do is we want to have some kind of like personalized, uh, so when you're doing a remote training, um, you want to be, be able to personalize your advice and recommendation, much like you'd walk up to someone at training and look over their shoulder and you know, maybe guide them. You want to be able to do that same thing. So we use something called gather dot, GatherTown or Gather.town, and this basically allows us to, you know, the little avatar walks up to someone, your video pops up, it looks like Legend of Zelda basically uh, on the Nintendo, and, uh, and then you can have these kind of privatized conversation so you can go and help someone. And that's really important here. Uh, again, I think it's really, you know, some people are a little maybe camera shy, but I think it's really important to be able to have the video and screen sharing capabilities so that you can really help someone, again, like you would at an uh, in-person training. I'm trying to optimize for remote. I think that's really important in, you know, our post-COVID era. It's travel's still really expensive and, and getting places, and, and you want to be able to enable people wherever they are. All right, let's see if video will work. Um, so this is just showing it kind of in action here. So this is us logging into the Chasm machine here. I click over just to the training to show you some of the commands that I'm going to go and copy there. Um, now I'm in the machine here. You can see that I'm making the machine full screen. So again, this is just, now I'm actually within the Ubuntu environment within a browser here, able to load up VS Code. I can drag and drop the uh, the locally installed uh, project. So this is just a Git project that's available to the public. Drop this here. You see that we have um, our repository. You have to, you know, the VS Code, you have to trust the authors here. But then we're opening a terminal and pasting the command here, which is just a West build for this board. And we're off to the races. So that was a little bit, that was about a minute there, getting all the way from, you know, clicking a button getting into an environment and getting a build started. Uh, and I would challenge people to do that on a locally installed machine with nothing else installed. I think that would be, that's a tough, a tough thing, right? You just because of download speeds and the various repositories you're doing there, even if you have the most minimalized uh, setup, I think it just takes a little while because of all the, the, the tools that you need to make uh, Zephyr go. Um, and I think we, yeah, we stopped. I don't show the whole build here. Again, at the end is building a binary. You then do have to download the binary off this remote machine onto your local machine, and then you can load that binary onto your device. So, uh, and you know, you could do the same for a .elf. You'd have to have uh, a 
different set of tools, maybe like an ozone debugger or something. You could run a debugger on your local machine as well, but it's not going to be able to use like West Flash and West Debug, which is one of the big downsides because that's like in my daily driving, I just I use West Flash all the time, and you don't get that here. But from a training perspective, I think it's really, really important. Okay, let's talk about some of the things that went right here. So we started running this thing. We started using Chasm. We started uh, trying this out we, with some, some friendly, friendly folks that we had. Um, we were using a, 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 the MagTag board from Adafruit, which is great. It uses the ESP32 S2. It has an e-ink screen on it, a bunch of sensors and stuff like that. Didn't have uh, USB CDC, which is not great for debugging when you don't have a serial output. Uh, but we were, uh, uh, we, we, we were able to get people kind of through the training. They were at least able to you know, ping the servers, blink some LEDs, that sort of thing. This was still a little too Linuxy, right? So this was still like, hey, everybody's going to you know, use text-based editing. Again, another thing you shouldn't assume. People want to use VS Code. They want to use the various editors. Uh, you know, you want to let them kind of install the tools they want and or use the tools they want. We then tried this with a larger train. We got up to 30 people. And uh, this started to really strain our ability to give individualized uh, attention to people. And so you, you still want to do that. So you want to kind of one, one to five, you know, like one trainer to five people is a kind of a best case scenario. I think one to 10 is, is really kind of straining it. And any more than that, you're, you're probably not serving the people that need help. Because, um, and again, it depends on what their experience level is. If they are doing a little bit of, if they've already done a little bit of Zephyr and you're trying to kind of move them up to intermediate level, you might be okay with that, but um, that's a little tougher. We tried an in-person training. Uh, this was great. Where we, had, we did this at Hackaday Supercon last year. We were, again, we were, using, we were all in person, but we were using the Chasm server. Uh, we had hardware in front of them, so they had that connection. This is where the Steam Deck person showed up. He actually was successful with it, which was, I thought was really, really great. Uh, he was able to use this Chasm server. He, you know, it was really scaled down, but he was able to build the, the firmware, pull it to his Steam Deck, program the device. Uh, so that's, that's really great. Uh, we were still using Python uh, because of the, the ESP tool.py. Um, uh, and so that was still a little bit difficult there because you're, again, you're kind of depending on what people have on their local machine. They might have various versions of Python or might not be that familiar with it. So it's, again, just kind of assuming that people, um, you don't assume anything about the people, really. You know, you just try and make it friendlier tools. Uh, we just did a recent training in June. I'd say this was probably our most successful yet. This is where we switched to the Nordic tools. So again, we had kind of this kinder interface, uh, you know, kind of a more GUI focused sort of thing. Um, we also changed some of our training too, so that it was more focused on the RTOS uh, kind of uh, lower level stuff. So you know, what are threads? How do I do device tree? You know, just more focused on a lot of the getting started content there. Um, just a little bit too short. So we actually are doing another training here. Um, so uh, there is a QR code. Uh, over at our booth, if you want to sign up for this, there's still a bunch of room in this. We're going to do a three-hour training. Um, so this is coming up on July 12th. Um, so you know, we, we don't actually know if people are going to show up with any embedded experience. We're, we had pre-qualified people in the past to be like, hey, you've at least done some embedded stuff before. People might show up at this one and be like, hey, I've, I haven't blinked an LED in Arduino even. So that's going to be a potential risk of this, but we'll see how it goes. All right, let's talk about some things that can go better. Uh, one thing that is kind of rough with this chasm and various um, things like gather town is the inception effect, right? You have a lot of windows. There's just a lot of window management. So one thing that we tell people is to take the chasm window. I kind of showed it where you take the chasm window by itself in a tab. You make that the uh, full screen. It kind of acts as a background. So if you're all tabbing over it, you can still get to other windows. But it's, it's still a little bit messy. You know, it's best if you have multiple screens, but you can't ask that people have multiple screens, especially in person. Um, so that's, that's kind of tough there. Uh, network still matters. This is not surprising, right? So you're streaming a remote container over, you know, a custom VNC to a browser. Like, yeah, your network's going to matter, right? If you put 30 people in a room, you might start to strain the Wi-Fi. Uh, so that is another thing you have to, to worry about there. Um, the way that this works, right, again, how, how this training works with downloading binaries like this, this isn't how we do Zephyr, right? This isn't, at least, you know, every day, Mike and I don't do Zephyr like this. We're using West Flash. We're using uh, built-in JLink tools and things like that. So that part is kind of outside of the normal flow. And um, I, all I can say is this is just to get people up and started, right? So just kind of keeping that in mind that we're just trying to get people 
up the curve enough so that they're like, yeah, I'm willing to go and spend the time and, and invest in my local tool chain and, and learn this stuff. Because a lot of it is about getting that first dopamine hit. So, and again, if you're thinking about doing this for your company too, you're trying to basically get buy-in on an idea, <laughs> which is using Zephyr, training with Zephyr, trying all these different things, just trying to get people interested in it enough to spend the time later. And so this might be a reason to do this sort of thing. And again, the last thing is the, the down, a downside is that you don't end up with the tools on your machine, right? So uh, you th you'd think you want people to walk out of a workshop and be able to like go and recompile later or try stuff later. Uh, all I have on this data point is that we offer that people can log in after the training using the Chasm server, even though we don't have additional machines spun up because we spin up like 30, 30 EC2 instances for 30 trainees. Well, uh, we can still host two or three people after the training, and I've yet to see anyone log in after the training. So if that's a, a measure, I, I, th I think that like th that kind of discounts this one, right? People will come back to the training on their own time when they want to do it. So don't expect them the next day. And again, we're just trying to get them enough dopamine that they're like, yeah, Zephyr's the answer, right? That's, that's, what, that's what we want people to do just so that they, they put in the time later. All right, some future experiments, because I know I'm running a little bit uh, short on time, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, let's talk about other things that are out there. So uh, things like code spaces and Git pond. So uh, Git, GitHub code spaces is basically you ship a, a, a file up to your repository that says, here's my development environment, and here's how my container is defined. And then you click on a button, and it launches a VS Code window in the browser. So kind of similar experience there. You're within VS Code, and uh, then you're usually able to build on top of that tool chain that is in a container from your VS Code environment, right? So it's kind of like, uh, it's just a containerized version of Zephyr, which you can also get off the, the Zephyr. Uh, a lot of the Zephyr maintainers also use containerized versions to maintain the, the tool chain. Uh, Git pods, another one that does that sort of thing. Downside is you still don't get that local hardware connection. So you might, uh, you might be able to develop and have some like standardization within your company, but you won't still be able to do West Flash, West Debug. As far as I know, again, if anyone knows after this talk, I want to talk to you. So come on up afterwards. Um, uh, another thing that's tough about this for, for my example is that I'm trying to train people outside of my org, right? So if I want someone to use my Git pod or my GitHub code spaces, I need them to like either sign up for GitHub if they don't already have it, or I need them to use my computing resources, right? In what I'm talking about with Chasm, I pay for the um, I pay for all those EC2 instances to be spooled up and ready to go. In this case, it's like you're kind of like depending on people's free credits, that sort of thing. Uh, one thing that we are looking at doing is, uh, so Nordic has some, some uh, VS Code tools. I think VS Code generally is kind of the, the unifier in a lot of this stuff. Um, like it or not, I think that VS Code is kind of becoming the new uh, uh, ad hoc uh, standard on a lot of, a lot of people's machines and, and tooling environments. I know a lot of the chip vendors are, are standardizing on it. Uh, and I think it is closer to this. You'd still run into a lot of the same problems, right? So you still have to download a lot of stuff. You still need to have your tool chain set up. There's still things that could go wrong. Um, but I think it would then be about the, the, the thing that would change would be how much you try and optimize your, your build so that you're using things like manifest files to really make your project very, very small. So you're only pulling in the you know, ARM GCC EABI, the, uh, basically you're only doing the, uh, the ARM GCC stuff that you're targeting or whatever your local tool chain needs to be, um, and your project is really uh, cut down as well. Um, another thing that we've talked about is getting all remote. So Wakwe actually has some experiments using Zephyr. If you don't know Wakwe, it's a really cool uh, virtualized hardware platform. Uh, kind of started with Arduino but allows you to bring in sensors and other things like that. Uh, there's a bunch of ESP32 support in there. Uh, we've actually done some experiments where we have compiled a binary uh, in Zephyr for the ESP32, and then you can actually you know, program it onto this emulated device, and then it actually talks to an emulated Wi-Fi gateway, and it actually talks out to the internet. So again, we're trying to emulate connected hardware here. That's a, that's a good experiment here. Um, so if you wanted to train people like a little bit more about like not just device tree, how do you make an LED connect to a certain pin, but also how do you actually inter interact with a virtualized you know potentiometer or some kind of more uh, in in depth hardware simulation, that would be the kind of the way to do it. And then I know people are going to ask about just like dev containers, Docker, that sort of thing. Um, 
a very realistic uh, request here. Personally, I think that uh, unless there was some super, super simple way of doing things, you know, maybe in VS Code, I know that Docker works in VS Code and stuff like that. Um, I, I just personally don't feel like this is the way for me. Um, uh, and then how do we troubleshoot things, right? So again, we're kind of always thinking about how you're going to troubleshoot the things that go wrong. Uh, and I feel like uh, localized Docker might not, might not be it uh, for me. There is a great talk about uh, dev containers. I'm not sure how this is going to come through. Oh, it, it's, there, there's a V on top of that, uh, that hexagon there. But um, uh, there, these slides are available online as well. So you should go and watch that talk. Um, yes, so uh, if you'd like to come and see a bunch of the hardware that we build, um, we're in booth 41. Uh, like I said, we do reference designs. We build Zephyr-based hardware just about every day. Uh, we write about Zephyr all the time on our blog. And um, that's also where you can sign up for training uh, as well if you're interested in that July 12th training. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd love to, I love brainstorming about this stuff. I'd love to hear about your personalized experiences. I'd love to take your questions. Um, and I hope to see you all at training sometime. So thank you. We, we have a mic for questions. I'll run to you so we can get on the recording. And we have some virtual questions too. Is anyone planning on doing training internally or externally? For the, for like hosting training for other people? One, all right. Two, three, four, five. Okay, great. How are you planning on doing it? <laughs> like that. <laughs> Basically, somebody already has its, uh, the, the okay. Okay. So, so one person in front was saying that already having the environment installed. So maybe your company already has uh, like a, a, a path for doing installation and that sort of thing that works. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Having standardized tooling, I think within a company, actually it, it helps, right? You, you're already working and trying to have like standardized tooling within a company. You might have a kind of a similar context there. I think that really helps a lot. You might have an IT group that helps you with that sort of thing too. But, uh, even if I have it locally, I, think, uh, I can still uh, join a, a, a training or put someone to join this training. Even if it's locally, it should work the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. All right, Benjamin's going to tell us how he's doing Zephyr training for the rest of the, the world here. Totally not. Uh, quick <laughs> question, the the cost of running something like Chasm, like per mm -hmm. participant, per day, per hour, like what are we looking at? Yeah, so um, Chasm has like a per license cost, which is like, I think, $10 per seat per month sort of thing. Um, and then, but in terms of like the actual server cost, um, it's 80 a month just to kind of host a EC2 um, large, T3 da, dot large. That's that's like the host machine, right? So uh, so in Chasm you have like a host machine, and that can host a couple of people in there. But then it also has all like user administration that sort of thing. But to spin up, so like for a four-hour training, if I go and spin up 30 EC2 uh, T3 dot dot mediums, right? I think it's a dollar per per instance. So like the if you think about like four hour chunk of just spinning up hardware like this is very, very affordable. I think the, the real cost is paying for something like Chasm or developing yourself or, and then hosting that kind of like always on thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you didn't uh, offer more information about the training on 12th July, mm -hmm. if it's hybrid, if it's uh online or something like it's, that? Uh, yeah, that's the one on the 12th is all remote. Uh, you have to buy your own hardware, but the training's free. It's all remote. Um, it starts at noon Eastern Standard Time. We have some questions slash comments. Um, <laughs> well, actually. <laughs> uh, so Sam said, some browsers now support web USB. Might be something to explore for connecting to users' local JTAG debug probes, question mark. Uh, followed with, also some JTAG probes have Ethernet interfaces, like JTRACE Pro, which, given use permission as well, can be accessed from JavaScript on the browser. Yes, that's great. Uh, I would love to try that. 
Uh, maybe, maybe. Have you have you tried using Web USB or similar technologies? Uh, we we haven't tried that yet. Um, yeah, I think that's li reaching the limits of my my capabilities uh, personally. And I think um, in terms of like exposing it through a container to the local browser, um, I'm not sh I'm not sure how to do that. I'm sure there's something out there. I haven't found it yet. Uh, also, Ethernet. Also, Ethernet. We have a blog post about that. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know which one you're talking about, but we've done some experiments with uh, oh, JTAG over Ethernet. JTAG over Ethernet, yeah. right? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, right. I think it's also about like you know. So again, this is for the stuff that we do. We're trying to do it so that's like readily available hardware, which is tough, right? I mean, you're basically like, what is something that's affordable that is available across the world? You know, we have people that are buying hardware, shipping it to India, shipping it to. Brazil, shipping it to all these different places. So it's like, is it available? Is it relatively inexpensive? Is it deliverable within a week or two? Um, like all of these things are important. Again, that's for like a public training like that. If you have a company, you might be, you might already have standardized hardware, that sort of thing. So, one in the back. So first of all, thanks for this very inspiring talk. Um, I have a question regarding the hardware because you said you're using those Nordic Connect, um, those Nordic SDKs, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Nordic uh, development kits. That's right. Yep. Um, do you ex actually expect the participants to already order them uh, by themselves, or do you ship them to the participants? Uh, good question. Yeah. So we, we uh, expect. So the training that we do is free, but yeah, the the user has to buy and ship it because you know, customs, VAT, all of the stuff that you want to make sure the, we don't know what, um, where they live, what all the restrictions are, um, export limitations as well. So uh, we basically lean on DigiKey, Mauser, all of the different distributors. Some local distributors have them as well. So yeah, um, we want to make sure that, so one of the things that went wrong in the last training that we did is that uh, I waited too long. Uh, I said, basically, I had sent out acceptance notices like 10 days before the training thinking, oh, like I can bo order a board within, you know, two days. Two day shipping is relatively affordable from like DigiKey to my house. But someone who's, you know, in India, they like said, oh, I, I can't get it within two weeks. Um, so that that's uh, that's a restriction there. OK, another question. Have you considered doing a flipped classroom? That is, the presentations are recorded and students watch at their leisure. You spend class time helping hands-on. I taught community college full-time for over a decade and found it pretty successful. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think that's kind of what we approximate with the written training. Um, in terms, of, we don't have any video stuff kind of embedded there, but with the follow along at your own pace, it really is the flipped classroom is that we're kind of going around this virtual class classroom and just trying to help people. You know. Uh, unblock them. So uh, we've had some feedback that like, hey, I expected there to be a little bit more presentation here, but uh, yeah, you can find a lot of videos online of us talking. <laughs> Hello. I'd like to ask about your customers, your potential customers. Uh, are they uh, very experienced programmers? Uh, are they students? I mean, what, what type of customers are you looking for? For um, uh, a lot of the people that kind of come in, I would say like uh, the typical person that is taking training that might be a cu might be a customer, don't know, um, would be um, a hardware developer, maybe maybe a beginning firmware developer who has done some stuff before. I've heard of like a lot of people like, oh yeah, I've used my vendor tools before in an Eclipse IDE and on Windows, and it just kind of worked. And now it's like coming to Zephyr. There's uh, you know kind of Linux forward uh, uh, ideas there. Uh, so that might be a little scary. And um, uh, trying to learn about device tree and things like that. I might also be projecting since that's where I came from. <laughs> okay, thank you. Run, John, run. <laughs> yeah, have you tried uh, just a regular virtual machine 
uh, because you mentioned the Docker's, uh, mm -hmm. but how about virtual regular machines? I'm asking because mm -hmm. I've lately attended the training with mm -hmm. regular virtual machine in the backend uh -huh. and remote uh, Visual Studio Code with remote SSH connected to this virtual machine, uh -huh. and it worked too really well. Okay, uh, that's great. Uh, so that was like talking to actual hardware as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Because uh, the USB is transferred to virtual machine, and okay. uh, in Visual Studio, uh, you know. You just feel like you are working on your host, but yeah. in fact, this is That's virtual. Yeah. yeah, no, I'd love to chat more about that afterwards, actually. That's, um, was that like a, when you say virtual machine as well, you mean like a, like a VMware or like a yeah, virtual box? Yeah, or virtual box. Okay. It, this was the only prerequisite, and yeah, this is challenging because everyone had to download those two gigabytes <laughs> as a prerequisite. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and some uh, Apple users also had some problems with, okay. uh, yeah. I think, M1. Uh, yeah, yep. That, so that's another thing we ran into recently as well. Like a lot of the tooling around the new Apple chips as well has, you know, usually there's, I think a lot of that has been started to shake out a little bit, but even just like some of the install and like the, the Nordic tools had some alternative instructions, right? So you just kind of point people um, with that. That's another thing to think about is a uh, new era of chips with Apple's dominance. All right. Well, if you, uh, if you want any demos later, I can show you uh, try.goliath.io is kind of our Chasm server. Um, I can show you that on my machine if you're interested in seeing that sort of thing. Um, if you want to check out the tr all the training materials, if you ever want to like follow along, I should have put this up here. I didn't put it up here. Training.goliath.io is actually where all those instructions are. Training.goliath.io. And so like this is how we teach people how to use Zephyr. Um, so, oh, wrong window. Thank you, John. Um, so, um, you know, we use uh, DocuSource, really great um, open source project from Facebook that's Markdown based. Um, and so, you know, just kind of follow along and do this sort of thing. There's an associated repo as well. So uh, if you already have Zephyr tools installed, easy way to start. Um, but I love brainstorming around training. I'd love to, you know, expand the training capabilities to bring more people into the fold and uh, check out Zephyr some more. So thanks so much for coming today.